some early key facts about them. Um, and we're going to uh, talk about the different types of lilacs. And I'm really going to concentrate on that a lot tonight because everybody thinks lilacs are the same and they're not. And if there's anything I want you to learn tonight more than anything else is that there are four series of lilacs. They don't interbreed. They bloom at different times and you need some from each group in order to prolong your lilac season to a couple of months instead of a couple of weeks. So we're gonna talk about how to do that. Uh, then we're gonna talk about the various flower forms and the colors that lilacs come in and how they're classified by those forms and colors. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what they require and what they like in terms of growing, uh, how to maintain them, how to make more of them. We'll talk about cuttings and suckers and grafts. Uh, we'll talk about how to preserve cut lilac flowers, which don't last very long as cut flowers. Uh, and we'll talk about lilac oil and perfume, which uh, is a pretty unknown area for almost everybody. And you'll be surprised to discover that lilac oil basically doesn't exist. And all the lilac scents you've probably ever smelled in your life are artificial and synthetic and not the real thing. But the real thing is available, but only in a very small supply by a very secretive process that we're going to talk about. And then I want you to learn about the public collections of lilacs that are available throughout the world. We're going to talk about those. I'll focus on a few of them here in Ohio, and we'll talk about some of the North American festivals that you can visit. And then I'm gonna finish up with a little bit about well-known lilacs, why most lilac cultivars can't be recognized on site, but that a few of them can, and I'm gonna show you those towards the end. All right, so where do lilacs grow? Well, the easy answer is in the temperate zones of the world. So that dark green area that you see there are where lilacs grow the best. Now, they will grow in the light green subtropical zones, particularly in the United States, but they need a lot of extra work in those areas and a little protection from some heat and maybe late afternoon sun, a little extra water. Uh, there's some things you can do, but uh, in general, it's the dark green yeah, areas. So I know that they grow down there, if you can see my, uh, a mouse down here in Tanzania. I've seen them down there and they also grow here in New Zealand in Dunedin area on the eastern southeastern coast. Uh, there's some very nice lilac collections in those two areas but there's really very little to speak of in the light green subtropical zone here except for a few up in the Blue Mountains south of Sydney. Um, so again they're really confined to the greenish areas. And yes, over here in Europe, in the Baltic area, and particularly in Western Russia, they're very dominant. And what people don't know is that today in the world, Russia is probably the center of lilac culture. They probably are doing more with lilacs than anybody else anywhere. Uh, they have more cultivars coming out of Russia than anywhere. Uh, and lilacs are the national flower in Russia. Uh, they were blooming at the end of World War II on Victory Day, and they became the symbol of their victory in World War II. Russians love to remind everyone of their victory in World War II, and lilacs are intimately connected with that as well. Over in North America, you can see the green temperate zone that lilacs grow in. They like and need cold temperatures, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Down in far South America, they theoretically can grow. I have not heard that they grow down there, and I would love for someone to tell me if they've seen any lilacs in South America. You'll see a little bit down here in South Africa, there's a little bit of subtropical zone where they theoretically could grow. I'll tell you, I spent uh, three weeks in South Africa last summer, and I looked diligently for them. I went to the botanical gardens. I went in the countryside and I never found a lilac. So I, I don't know, they may not be there in, in South Africa. In North America, they grow pretty much everywhere I have circled there on the map. 
Uh, the general rule is zones three through seven are no problem at all. Um, they will grow in zone eight with a little extra care. And I even know of a few that will grow in zone nine. Uh, you have to have a specific cultivar that's known to do well in what's called a low chill area where they don't get very cold in winter. It's not the heat so much that bothers them, it's the lack of cold because the cold is what sets their flowers and they need that cold in winter to set them. So yes, they do grow over here in Arizona and they do grow in California and even a few here in Los Angeles, but up in the hills only uh, like where Descanso Gardens is. And yes, Canada is a big center for lilacs. Lilacs will grow up to zone two uh, without any problem, usually not in zone two, but starting in zone 3A. And you can see that consists of a lot of uh, the more populated regions of Canada. So they'll grow almost everywhere in Canada. I'm told they grow over here in Vancouver. I have not been able to find out if they grow in Victoria or not. It seems like it might be a little warm and, and not so much warm, but lack of cold in the winter. They don't get much freezing or uh, much in the way of snow. All right, let's talk about the types of lilacs. This is the part that I really want you to learn tonight. And that is there's four types of lilacs or what we call four series of lilacs. They're the common lilacs, which are called syringa, same as the genus. The little leaf lilacs, which are the pubescentes in Latin. The late lilacs, or the velocae, And the tree lilacs, or the ligastrina. We'll refer to them by their common names just because that's a little easier for most people to remember here tonight. Uh, the pictures up there are indeed of the four series over on the far left is a common lilac. In here are the, uh, this is actually a Korean lilac, uh, pubescence, pubescence, uh, but a member of the little leaf lilacs. Uh, the late lilacs with their different kind of leaves, which we'll mention more later. And then the true tree lilacs. And I'm not talking about common lilacs that have been trained to look like trees. I'm talking about true tree lilacs. So within each of those four categories, there's some significant species. And there's lots of species and lo lots of natural ones, lots of hybrid ones. Uh, but these are the ones that you probably should be able to learn the names of if you're gonna be interested in lilacs. The common lilac being this vulgaris right here. We're gonna talk about some of the others and I have great pictures for you. The importance of these four series is that they do not interbreed and they all bloom at different times. And the way I have them listed is the order in which they bloom. So the common lilac is first, then the little leaf, then the late, and then the tree. And if you have say one of each one of these, you can have a season that goes on for eight weeks of blooming. And that's the key to getting a prolonged lilac bloom. Just as a little preview, I'll tell you this species in the common called Hyacinthiflora is the earliest blooming of all lilacs. And they also happen to be the ones that do the best in warm climates. So down in zone eight uh, and maybe even in zone nine, they're the ones that might be able to flower down there. By the way, lilacs will grow just fine in zone eight and nine, but they won't always flower is the problem, okay? They're too cold for flowering. Here's what the four different lilac series look like. So over there on the far left is a common lilac and you can see it's sort of heart-shaped leaf. And then in here are the uh, little leaf hairy lilacs, they're called. There's patula, pubescens, and microphylla, the smallest leaf. And you can see how much they're smaller they are than the other lilacs. Then over here are the late lilacs and look at that leaf. It's a lighter green usually. It's long and oblate and has very prominent veins through it and kind of a rough texture to the surface. Very distinct from the common lilac. And then finally, here are the tree lilacs. There's actually three different kinds of tree lilacs. The common one that you'll see planted on streets everywhere nowadays is the Japanese tree lilac, which is the reticulata. And then there, here's the Amur lilac and then finally the Peking 
and the different shape of leaves that they have. So let's go through some of these, at least through the four series. And that's the way I'm going to do it. That little number up here will tell you what series that you're in. So we're in the first series, the common series, the Syringa series. And the most common lilac is Syringa vulgaris. Vulgaris is Latin for common, not vulgar, for common. All right. So uh, the common lilac is the one that you buy in most stores. It comes primarily in the natural hybrids in the lilac and the white colors. It's native to Eastern Europe. And one of the things you may not yet know is that there are only two species of lilacs that come from Eastern Europe and all the rest come from Asia. All right. So they all had to be brought to the United States and to North America by the early settlers in the 1700s. The common lilac has the largest flowers, the largest individual florets, and the largest panicles. And it's one of the reasons why it's often valued as the best lilac out there. Uh, it blooms usually in about mid-May, but obviously that depends on your latitude, your hardiness zone. Uh, probably the last areas where it blooms will be in early to at latest mid-May for the common lilac way up in Canada. Um, this is also well known because it has the great lilac fragrance. Not all lilacs smell the same. But the common lilac is the one that we know and love for its wonderful fragrance. There are hybrids of these common lilacs. We call them cultivars or cultivated varieties. And there's over 1,500 of them. So as the uh, international registrar, I'm the guy charged with keeping track of all of them. We actually have about 2,500 uh, cultivars in the world and 1,500 of them are from the common lilac. Uh, so that is actually available to the public uh, on the International Lilac Society's webpage if you ever wanna look one up, easy to do. There's seven official flower colors and there are about 11 bud colors. As we go through here, I'm gonna show you some of the most common ones or distinctive ones. I chose one that's not common, Alexandria Pakhmutov, which is a pink. It is a Russian hybrid. It is not available in North America to my knowledge. And this is unfortunately true of lots of cultivars because in North America, particularly in the United States, it is forbidden to import lilacs. So all these wonderful cultivars that are being developed in Eastern Europe and Russia are illegal to import into the United States. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. President Lincoln has long been known as one of the best blue lilacs out there. Uh, Albert F. Holden, a very well-known, common and easily grown one and Agincourt Beauty is the same. So you can see some of the color differences in them as well. So there's another species in these, this series of lilacs, the Syringa series, that will interbreed. And these are the Chinese lilacs, they call them, or chinensis. They are not from China at all. They're a natural hybrid that was discovered in Europe. We don't know how it came about. We think it was a natural hybrid by uh, combining another species with the common lilac. Uh, it's well known because it has a rather small oblong leaf its colors are white sometimes to mostly pink and lilac. Like the common lilac, it's got a great fragrance. It's mostly single flowers. Uh, there's one double form that's pretty famous called duplex that was only rediscovered about 50 years ago uh, and is my absolute favorite lilac of all time, duplex chinensis lilac. It is early blooming. It'll bloom a little bit before the common lilac, actually, and probably with the hyacinth of flora. Uh, just a great lilac. And notice how dense it is. Look at the density of that bloom on that shrub. And you saw that picture at the beginning of the Montreal Botanic Gardens also. Uh, that's the way they bloom. They just envelop you in all of their blooms and their fragrance. It's wonderful to sit among them. By the way, over here, that's duplex, the double flower form. We'll talk a little bit about flower forms again in a few minutes, um, but it's the only one that has that double flower form. Most of them are like this one on the right that have the single florets with four petals to each floret. 
Another important common lilac to know about is the hyacinthiflorus. So these are a cross between the common lilac or vulgaris and the earliest known lilac from China called oblata. You don't have to remember that, but you might want to remember hyacinthiflora because it'll be marked on all these lilacs that they sell. And these are commonly sold in the nurseries and at various lilac specialty online stores as well. Uh, they are wonderful. They're very much like the common lilac. The main thing is they bloom about a week before the common lilac. So they're one of the ways of extending your season. Uh, they've got a normal vulgaris type leaf. Uh, one of the ways I distinguish them from the common lilac is they have more purple hints in their leaves when they're very young and in the fall when the, the colors are changing. So you can sometimes distinguish them based on that. They've got the same colors as the common lilac. They've got the same great fragrance. And like the common lilac, they have lots of single and double flowers. So the main thing that recommends them is that they bloom a week earlier than the common lilac and are a way for you to prolong the season. So uh, the ones I have showing there for you, just in case you want to find your favorite, up at the top left, Sweetheart. Everybody loves the uh, contrast between the, the bud color and the lilac flower color in Sweetheart. Uh, then Declaration on the top right there, and that's uh, developed by the U.S. National Arboretum. Uh, it's freely available to anybody that wants to make a, a clone of it. Uh, they don't have any patent or copyright on it when they released it. It has a lot of changing purplish colors, which you can see even right here, how they differ in their color. They're not as uniform as many other lilacs. Down here, Pocahontas, well known for the intensity of its bloom. A great white called Sister Justina a nice uh, blue called Dr. Chadwick, and finally Esther Staley, a wonderful pink. So if you see those names, these are great lilacs to own. And the last species of the common lilac I think you should know are the Persian lilacs, or S. persica. We don't know how it came about. It's a, a hybrid, maybe a natural one, maybe artificial, but it appeared in uh, Turkey somewhere around 1700. Its leaf is kind of small like the chinensis that we just talked about. It's got a few more colors. It's got the same great fragrance of common lilacs, but only comes in single flower form. But you can do a lot of things with it. Look at the big natural shrub on the right. And then over here is a bonsai version of a Persian lilac that was on display here in Columbus last year that I took that picture of. Okay, that's our first series of lilacs, the common lilac. And now we're going to talk about the second series, uh, which starts blooming at the end of the common lilac's bloom and then goes after the common lilac is done. So it's a nice way to prolong the season. We call it the little leaf lilac because its leaves are smaller, uh, although they do vary in size. So uh, the pubescence probably has the largest leaf, the microphylla the smallest. Um, it's sometimes called the Korean lilac, uh, the three subspecies that I mentioned, and uh, the colors are white, pink, and on occasion, rarely purple. Uh, something that's important about them is most of them are smaller in height. As a matter of fact, uh, they rarely get beyond six or seven feet, and many of them can be as small as two to three feet, although most are somewhere in between. So these have become really popular in recent years because they suit our smaller home gardens a little bit better than the common lilacs. They also have a great lilac fragrance. Uh, so you can't go wrong with the little leaf lilacs. Here are some different types of cultivars of them. Uh, one of my favorites up here is George Eastman because it has that intense red bud color. Miss Kim, I'll, I'll bet you half of you at least have heard of Miss Kim. It's sold in garden centers everywhere. It's this very light pink color. It's the patula uh, version of the little leaf lilac. Palabin is a little more of a purple. You can see it here and here, a very nice looking shrub. And then this one here at the bottom left, I don't know if you can see it good enough or not. It's called hers, and that is not in contrast to his or him's. 
Uh, it's actually named after a guy named Joseph Herz, who uh, first discovered it over in Korea. Uh, and the thing that it's famous for is how it hangs down a pendulousness to it that's very rare among lilacs. Uh, so it's hard to find, um, but very unique if you ever run across it. The other nice thing about uh, the Little Leaf series is they rebloom, unlike almost all the other lilacs. And, and yes, the occasional common or late lilac will rebloom one or two florets here and there. But as a rule of thumb, they don't rebloom, whereas these little leaf lilacs will rebloom. The intensity of the rebloom is much less than the initial rebloom, but it's there and they still smell great and I love to have them. I have two of them reblooming in my yard right now. Uh, and just seeing them and smelling them right now is wonderful. Uh, so I think it's really important people know about the reblooming capabilities of the Little Leaf Lilac series. This is also the only lilac that tends to have some nice color in its fall leaves. So this is what they can look like. These pictures are from a gentleman who was and may still be on our call from Japan, Hideo Ahara, who has um, invented many cultivars of the little leaf lilac uh, because he wanted them to be small and fit on the balconies that are so common in Japan since they don't have a lot of large homes and a lot of large land. So he grows them in containers and most of these are from two by two to three by three in height and uh, he'll grow them in containers. They might double that size if you stuck them in the ground to grow them. But look at those beautiful colors that he's got. And no one in the world has lilac leaf colors like this, except the ones he's invented over in Japan, which you'll probably remember, we're not allowed to import into the United States. Uh, but surprisingly enough, once in a while, some of these start to appear in the US. Who knows how they get here? Uh, there is a little exception for importing lilacs via Canada, uh, but it's really difficult to do. Uh, and that's why they only slowly make their way here from around the world. Okay, that was the second series, right? So the common lilacs blooming first, the hyacinth flora part of it is a little bit before the common one. And then we have the little leaf lilac blooming at the end of the common lilac and going on past that. And then towards the end of the little leaf lilac, we have this late series of lilac. So it does come in white to pink colors. It's got those unusual leaves from the other series. It has its own fragrance. It's often described as spicy. Lots of people love it. Some people don't like it at all. I happen to love it, but it is definitely different than the common lilac. Uh, the fragrance is different. Uh, these uh, are somewhat endangered. Um, the S. Josicaea that I'm showing you pictures of there is the only endangered lilac in the world because its natural habitat in Ukraine and Romania have contracted in size due to development and uh, are in danger of being exterminated and getting rid of the natural habitat of Josicaea, the late lilac. So Josicaea is one of the two lilacs in the world that come from Eastern Europe, the common lilac, and this version of the late lilac. There's other kinds of late lilacs, the Kamarawis. Uh, the most important one I have highlighted here is Reflexa. So this is a Reflexa up here. And over here on the left, you can see why they call it Reflexa. It reflexes down on itself. It hangs down, almost like a wisteria vine. Very unusual, very unique, and makes for beautiful lilacs. There are some different um, subspecies under the Tomentella, it's called. But again, these are all pretty much late lilacs. This one has a little bit of uh, different color variation. Uh, it has the same spicy fragrance, larger, rougher leaves than the other series, very similar to the Josicaea. And then finally, I want to talk to you about the fourth series of lilacs, which are the true tree lilacs. So the true tree lilacs are also called the Japanese lilacs, although they're not only from Japan. But reticulata is primarily from Japan. It has a smooth bark, uh, somewhat cherry-like looking. It can grow very large. 
Um, there is a arboretum near here called Dawes Arboretum that has 15 mature tree lilacs of different kinds and they tower twice as high as the ones you can see in this picture. They're unbelievably huge. They're probably 80 to 100 years old. Uh, just a magnificent sight to see. Uh, there are two kinds of these Japanese lilacs, the reticulata or the biggest leafed one, and then one that's called amarensis, uh, the Manchurian or amar lilac, a little bit smaller leaves, a little bit smaller tree. It's the last to bloom of all the lilacs around here. They bloom in early June. They only come in white. They do have the yellow buds that you can see up here in the pictures. Uh, the cultivars uh, that are named like ivory silk have better tree form and better flower form. And that's why we have good names for them. Uh, there's one other kind of tree lilac. It's called the, the peak Chinese tree lilac or pecanensis. Uh, it is a much smaller lilac. It gets cherry-like bark as well. On the bottom left there is an extremely rare picture uh, that was provided to me by Hong Sha Kui, uh, who's on the call here tonight, uh, who's a great lilac researcher in Beijing, China. Uh, and this is her recent picture of the uh, peak innocence or, or Chinese tree lilac blooming in its natural habitat up in the mountains in Northern China near the Mongolian border. Uh, you can see the, the shrubs growing on the uh, mountainous countryside blooming in the wild there. A very, very rare view of the Peking lilac uh, in its natural habitat. Uh, this one, by the way, does come in some yellow flowers. Uh, Beijing gold is one of them, so there are some cultivars that are a little different. And it's a smaller tree, as you can see in the picture. Mike, uh, anything we should talk about uh, question-wise before I go on? So there are a couple questions. Uh, one is, um, um, uh, why is it so difficult to import many cultivars in the United States? And the other one was, um, do you need to do anything special to get the little leaf lilacs to rebloom? Great questions. Uh, importation is a topic in itself. Uh, I will tell you that theoretically you can import 12 uh, lilac plants uh, bare rooted from, from Canada. Uh, it is possible to do that. Uh, and Canada has a little looser restrictions importing from other countries. So that's kind of the backdoor way to get them into the United States. Um, but the main reason, of course, like many other plants, is they don't want to import diseases and pests. Uh, all these diseases and pests that we deal with today all came from foreign countries, the, the ones that took out uh, the chestnut and are taking out all the ash trees. And they've all been imported, and they don't want that to happen. And there are definitely uh, diseases that lilacs are susceptible to that can be imported. Um, my only response to that, and that's what they tell you, is that almost all those diseases are already present in North America. Uh, frankly, I don't know of any that aren't already present. So it makes sense to me that you should have a program that allows them to be inspected and certified as disease-free and imported into the US. But uh, try and tell our congressional representatives and executive branch administrators that uh, it's a losing battle. Uh, the other question, Mike, was on the reblooming, reblooming of the little leaf lilacs. So I've talked to uh, one of the preeminent uh, breeders of them up in Michigan, uh, Tim Wood and Megan Maffei from Spring Meadow Nursery about this. And it seems that the key is cooler temperatures and lots of water. So they'll tend to rebloom better in the zone four and five areas, and they do need lots of water to rebloom. The hotter it is, the drier it is, the less they seem to want to rebloom. And those that do rebloom in those areas tend to do so when it cools off in September, uh, late September. Uh, so that's the key to that. Mark, there was one other question earlier on, I think even before you started speaking, it looks like maybe from Bernadette, and I assume she means on lilacs, but she says, can bacterial blight be treated with copper fungicide now? So bacterial blight, by definition, is caused by bacteria. And a fungicide, by definition, is an antifungal. So the answer is no. You treat fungal diseases with fungicides and bacterial diseases with antibacterial solutions. 
So uh, it's possible to say that there are certain fungicides that are also antibacterial, uh, copper sulfate being one of them. Uh, so it is possible to treat both fungi and bacteria with uh, a copper sulfate solution. So we have to kind of distinguish between what we're treating. Uh, viruses, bacteria, fungi are all different things and they need different types of treatment. We sort of learned that in the current pandemic, viruses are very resistant to treatment and there's not a lot to do about them besides cut them out and throw them out. And I'm talking about plants, not people. Anything else, Mike? All right, well, let's go on and uh, let's start talking about the flower forms and colors. A really important part of lilacs and the different cultivars that we have. So there are three flower forms that you should know about. The single flower form right here on the left shows four petals per floret. And these, of course, are the buds up here. Uh, and we'll talk about how lilacs sometimes have different kinds of petals, but four is the standard number. Here in the middle, you can see that there are multiple florets kind of stacked on top of each other, and we would call that double. So if you looked at that, it'd probably have about eight florets. And then on the right here are what are termed multi-petal or radial doubling florets. And they're still all in the same plane. It's not like one is inserted on the other, like in the middle here. Instead, they're all around. And look at this one here. Uh, you can count what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven or so uh, florets on that one. Uh, here's one, two, three, four, five there. Here's one, two, three, four, five there. Lots and lots of multi-petaled florets. And notice how they're kind of cupped. So any lilac lover in the world will know which one this is. And I'm not going to tell you because it's going to be part of the quiz at the end. Uh, and I can see Pat Maurer uh, sitting there smiling because she is responsible for finally making this particular cultivar much more available to the lilac world. And you should start seeing more of them around in the future. But it's a great discovery and a great lilac. We'll talk about it a little bit more over. Now, the only other thing I want to tell you is that the double form only occurs among the common lilacs, and I, and I put down here vulgaris, that's not quite true. It's in the hyacinth of flora. We have one in the chinensis, but my point being it's only in the common lilac series that you're going to find this particular form. All the others are going to be singles in the uh, little leaf lilacs, the late lilacs, and the tree lilacs. Ah, look at this busy slide with all those colors. All right. So one of my favorite pictures in the world is the paint palette over here on the right, uh, which was composed and thought of by Tatiana Polyakova in Russia, who is one of the, and probably is the greatest lilac expert in the world today. She's one of the few who can recognize hundreds of different cultivars on site. And she put this together to teach people about the seven recognized whister colors, we call them, of lilacs. And those are what are in this little box here. Uh, we start out with white, which is this one here. Violet, number two, you notice the Roman numerals and that's how we designate them. So here's a violet there. Here's blue or bluish, we call it. Here's a lilac color, pink and pinkish, magenta, and finally purple. So one through seven in the Roman numerals, and everyone in the lilac world knows what each one of those Roman numerals means. And yes, there are many variations in between those and sometimes it's hard to classify them. And sometimes the people that classified them got them wrong. Uh, sometimes the color varies depending on your climate and your soil. Uh, but it's still a nice guide to the type of lilac that you're dealing with. The other thing that is not talked about a lot with lilacs is the bud color. So to date, we really haven't recorded bud colors of lilacs. And yet when you look at the pictures, as I'm gonna show you, the bud color is an integral part of the beauty and color of lilacs. So these colors at the top represent a classification of bud colors, somewhat similar to the Worcester flower colors, but you see there's a greater range of colors up there. Uh, and they are almost always darker than the flower colors, which provides a great contrast. 
So bud and flower color are really important. So when you see someone saying a lilac is an S or a D, that means a single or double flower form. And when you see them say that it is a uh, S4, it's a single lilac kind of lilac. Or an S7, it is a single form purple lilac. And you're gonna see me list those a little bit after this. Well, what do lilacs need to grow? The answer to that is not much, not much. They need lots of sun. You're gonna to have to have six hours a day. They will not grow under trees. They will not flower in shade. They will grow, but they won't flower. Uh, they need a neutral to alkaline soil pH, generally in the 6.5 to 8.0 range. So contrast this to one of our other great flowering shrubs, the rhododendrons and azaleas, um, which can get by with four to six hours of sun and need acid soil. So they're very different than lilacs. So in Ohio, lilacs grow great in three-fourths of Ohio, but not so well in Northeast Ohio, which has lots of acid soil, okay? But what grows great in Northeast Ohio are azaleas and rhododendrons, which do very poorly here in uh, Central Ohio. Uh, so a little difference in the soil requirements. And then the last thing that they need is good drainage. They don't like wet feet. They don't like their roots sitting in any water. They don't like to be in a depression or the bottom of a hill. They like to be on either the top of the hill or on the hillside sloping down. So flat land, you have to be careful that they're not sitting somewhere that stays wet, uh, if that's what you're gonna plant them on. Over in Eastern Europe, they almost always grow on um, rocky hillsides, limestone hillsides, to give you an idea of what they really like in their natural habitat. So these are some areas that uh, they've been planted in. These are flatter areas, um, but they have good drainage. Uh, this young lady here, uh, Cheryl Pan Dawson, who I haven't seen is on here tonight, she might be, um, grows them up in Cherry Valley, New York, and she gathers them by the giant basketball basket full, uh, which I'm gonna show you what she does with them in a little bit. Okay, now they like to have a little bit of maintenance. Uh, they'll still flower and bloom for you if you neglect them, but they do much better if you do a little bit of maintenance. So what do they like? Well, they like to be pruned to height about once per year. Uh, my rule is I prune my lilacs to a height as high as I can reach with my pruning shears or my hedge trimmer. And that's because I like to keep my lilacs down at eye level and nose level. Uh, so you can do that, and the time to do that is, at least at the top and the sides, is within two weeks of the flowers dying. And the reason you do that is because lilacs are one of those flowers, like about half of the hydrangeas, that set their flowers the year before. So this summer, next year's lilac flowers have already been set on your lilac uh, shrubs and bushes. So you don't want to prune lilacs any more than two weeks after the flowers are done blooming. Because if you do, you're going to cut off next year's flowers. It's probably the biggest reason for flowers not coming out on lilacs is excessive pruning later in the summer. Um, they like a little bit of fertilizer, not much. Lilacs rarely need fertilizer. For, frankly, they don't need it. That's why I didn't put them in the need category. But they do need a little bit of fertilizer to show their best. Usually a 5-10-5 is best. The 10 uh, emphasizes the uh, flowering portion of that. Uh, it's good to have a grass and weed-free base if you can. A little bit of mulch, perhaps about a three foot diameter minimum is what I would recommend underneath your lilac. That way they can get some rain down to their shallow roots and you won't be tempted to uh, hit the branches with your lawnmower when you do the grass around them. So uh, to emphasize some of this, let's look at some of these uh, pictures. How about these two little kids going down the lilac hedgerow? This is obviously an old photograph. The lilacs are 20 feet tall. Um, it's beautiful. I'm sure it smells great, uh, but it's sort of the old style where they let them go free and all the blooms are up here at the top and that down here where these little kids can smell them. So I don't like that as much as uh, it, as romantic as it still looks. 
Over here is more of a modern look to how you maintain your lilacs. This is from Lilacia Park in Lombard, Illinois, uh, that has a wonderful collection of lilacs. Down here on the bottom left is a massive collection of uh, lilac shrubs up in Cherry Valley, New York. Uh, although I'm sure they wish they had a little bit of open mulched area around the base of each of these lilacs as well. Notice how it is on a hillside slope, which gives them great drainage and they're in a very open southern facing slope as well. Uh, just a beautiful area to have lilacs. Up here, oh, what's, what's wrong here? What happened to this? funny looking, dead looking one. Well, first of all, it's winter, so it's not dead, but it doesn't look real healthy, does it? It hasn't been maintained well. It's been neglected. It's been let go. Uh, this is up in uh, the Hudson Valley in New York where I found this one. Um, it hasn't uh, been pruned in a long time. It looks like it was down here at one point, but then was just kind of let go and not properly cared for. So your, your winter lilac shouldn't look like that. Over here on the left is actually my backyard. Uh, I'll show you a better picture of that. Uh, but this is kind of what I inherited when I moved in here 10 years ago. This was a thistle filled weedy hillside next to a recently widened highway up here at the top. And I couldn't even get back here. It was so um, remote and thistle filled and hard to get to. And it took me several years to transform this area to get rid of all the thistle and plant these little bushes with the stones in front to keep them from washing away on this hillside and plant grass and crown vetch and allow these lilacs to grow. And you'll see the result uh, of uh, my efforts there in a few minutes. Okay, want to know how to make lilacs? You want to know how to make them for free? You don't have to pay for your lilacs. Just go find some lilacs and cut off a few pieces or dig up some suckers or take a winter scion and graft it. So let's talk about that for just a minute. Cuttings, so what are cuttings? They are little four to six inch lengths of the softwood spring green growth. So this is nothing with brown bark on it. This is the green stuff that grows in the spring as new branches or stems. So you just cut off the tip of it for four to six inches, leave two to four leaves at the tip and strip all the others from the base of it. You dip the end in a little growth hormone. Uh, for those who want to know, 0.8% IBA rooting hormone is uh, what I recommend because lilacs are a little hard to root. And then you go sticking it one or two inches deep in a rooting medium. Now what's rooting medium? Well, it could be pure coarse sand if you want it to be like paver sand or it can be a mixture, an equal by volume mixture of sand and either potting soil, perlite, or peat, whatever floats your fancy in terms of what you like to do. So the trick with doing cuttings is that you have to keep the leaves constantly moist and humid using either misting or a setup of a fogging system because they don't have any roots, right? So they can't get any water from the soil. They have to get all their water from the leaves, which get it from their environment or water that uh, congeals on their leaf surface. So if you're gonna do it in a pot, maybe you wanna stick six cuttings in a six inch pot, you can stick uh, something on top of that. A lot of people will use uh, milk cartons uh, or they'll put them in a clear plastic bag and seal them up and then they'll mist them with a little misting bottle uh, two or three times a day. And if you're willing to do that for one to three months, you're likely to get some roots. Uh, it's a very interesting process. There's a lot more to it than what I just said, but it's not that hard to do. Uh, over on the right there is my personal setup for cuttings. So the little green tent you see there is my enclosed tent outside where I have misting nozzles hung inside uh, to keep them constantly misted. I have it on an automatic timer so I don't have to about worry about running out of there every uh, eight hours or so to miss these. And inside this picture here is my little uh, four to six inch cuttings with the labels as to what they are. And then up top is what you get once they've rooted and this is a year later and what they'll look like. So I have lots of free lilacs. Uh, this year I gave away about 50 free lilacs to the Master Gardeners and hopefully can continue doing that in future years. You can also get free lilacs, free lilacs off the suckers or offshoots. 
So the pictures up here, I want you to see, here is, in this photo here, the main lilac root uh, uh, plant. Over here is an offshoot, or what people call suckers. And this sucker can be followed all the way back to the main plant to confirm that it is a true cultivar off of that plant. And then that can be severed and the little hairy roots that go with this are enough to put it in some rooting medium and make yourself an entirely new plant off of that. So this is what it looks like down here underneath this bigger lilac. Here's a little offshoot. And this one, here's the bigger lilac. And down here's a little offshoot. So there's a lot of ways to handle that. You really want to make sure that it's coming off the mother plant so that you know it's going to be the same cultivar. Um, you can cut the root connection near the mother plant, dig up the sucker with as many roots as possible. Or if you want to cut it off the mother plant and just leave it there to, to get more roots for the next six to 12 months, you can do that too. Uh, and then you put it in a potting soil, pot it up and water it off in that first year. And it should be ready to plant a year after that. No problem at all. And the last free way to get them is to graft them. So you can take a common lilac plant that uh, is easily available, not worth too much money. Uh, you can cut it and you can make a matching cut in a winter piece of wood from a desirable cultivar and match the two ends together. You can use a tool, you can use a knife. Uh, there is a little bit of a learned skill to how to make the cuts to graft them together. And I tell you that I certainly had to take a couple of years of lessons on how to do it to get good at it, uh, but it works and it can be done in the middle of winter. And it's a great way to get some uh, rare lilacs uh, saved, if you will, as opposed to reproducing a, a lot of them. Uh, pencil size, uh, you don't have to use common lilacs. You can use privet, which is uh, really in the same genus. Uh, you can use uh, ash or forsythia but it's best if you use one of the other series in lilacs. Um, I like to use the late lilacs and the tree lilacs because they don't send up suckers. The common lilacs do, and once you plant these out, you don't want the rootstock uh, suckers coming up and taking over. Uh, you want the grafted part of it uh, being the one that you keep. So the desired lilac cutting is called the scion, and the common lilac base is called the rootstock when you go to do this. Uh, you got some pictures there of how I uh, fitted them together. I rubber banded them in place and I put a little uh, wax uh, on top of them to seal it from the weather and air and diseases. Uh, you wait one to three months to see if new growth sprouts from your scion. Uh, and then after six to 12 months, you can unwrap that uh, graft root and it'll look like a normal uh, lilac, uh, even though its rootstock is not. So lilacs uh, are best done on their own roots, but grafting is a great option for saving uh, more rare ones. So cut lilac flowers for vases. They don't last very long in vases, I'll tell you. And if you just cut them and stick them in a vase, they'll be done in 24 hours. Uh, but you can make them last up to about five days, uh, depending on how you treat them. So this is what I tell you to do. Um, you want to have a very clean, heavy base vase, because they're tall, washed with soap and water, and stick a teaspoon of bleach in it uh, before you go filling it up with water. So this kind of purifies it. The problem with lilacs is they get bacterial proliferation in the water that go up into the vascular tissues of the stem very quickly. And what you're trying to do is cut down on this bacterial growth that's gonna plug up the vascular channels and keep the lilac flowers from getting the water that they need. So then you fill it with fresh water, a floral preservative, which is basically sugar, and uh, add that teaspoon of uh, either bleach or lemon oil uh, which is an acidifying agent to keep the bacteria from proliferating. The stems that you choose should have two thirds to three fourths of the flowers open. You do want buds because buds provide contrast and color. Uh, and remember lilacs do not open anymore after you cut them. What you have when you cut it is what you will keep. Uh, I cut them to the length I want depending on the vase in the morning. I plunge them in fresh cool water for about an hour. Uh, and then I go ahead and uh, cut them up to get them ready for the vase. I remove most of the leaves, except those that are at the very top, because leaves just bring bacteria into the water. Uh, if you want, you can stick some leaf stems in later. 
And then when I'm ready to stick them in the water, remember I cut them maybe an hour ago, uh, you cut off the bottom one inch of the stems, usually at a 45 degree angle, giving it a little more area to absorb the water. Uh, and then the controversy is whether or not to smash the bottom of the stems. I'll tell you, the Russians smash their stems all the time. They use hammers uh, and they swear by it. Um, I have a little more theoretical problem with that. It seems to me it would disrupt the uh, vascular channels of the stem and keep it from absorbing the water. But I don't know the right answer at this point in time, uh, so uh, we'll see. So what about your lilac perfumes and oils and soaps and things like that? Well, I'm gonna tell you that everything you've ever bought, assuming you haven't bought from the lady in my picture, is fake. It's synthetic. It's not authentic. It can smell a lot like the lilac fragrance, but it cannot reproduce it because it is not the real thing. The reason is that lilac oil does not exist in the flowers, unlike say roses and rose petals, where you can get lilac oil out of the petals. It doesn't exist in the petals of lilacs. It's made at the base of the lilac flower and released directly into the air, that fragrance is. It can only be made into an oil with that fragrance by the secretive process of cold enfleurage. Enfleurage. If you've never heard of enfleurage, take a look at it. You can find lots about it on YouTube. It's been a secretive process for thousands of years. The Europeans guarded the secret of how to do this. As a matter of fact, when this lady, Charlpan Dawson, went to try and do this. She went all over Europe. She went down to South America, to Colombia, where they do this. She tried to get them to tell her how to do it, and they wouldn't tell her. It's a very closely guarded trade secret. Uh, but what they didn't know is that not only does she love lilac, she's a chemist and was her entire life. And she spent a lot of time figuring out this entire process. And in 2017, she got it all figured out. And not only did she figure it out and start making this stuff, she made videos of it to teach the world how to do this. So it is no longer a secretive process. And you can find her videos on YouTube as well. So she makes it up at her farm in Cherry Valley, New York, which is, by the way, only about uh, 10 miles uh, from Cooperstown, where the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame is, if you ever want to go visiting up there. And she's the only one in the world making it, to my knowledge. I threw her website down there for you to look at. Uh, this is her in her laboratory, which is sort of a, a little outbuilding shed uh, on her farm property. Uh, and there's a lot of chemistry involved, I have to tell you. She does run a class every year, usually in June or July, on how to do this. She charges a fair amount, but it, you got to go stay there basically for uh, a week or two to learn how to do this and figure out all the equipment that you're going to need to do it. So it's not an easy process, but a very rewarding one. Um, so basically what you do is you have to lay fresh flowers on a fatty pomod for 24 hours, and you got to replace it with more fresh flowers every day for 33 days. And the released fragrance is absorbed into that fatty pomod. So you need 16 bushels of flowers for a pound of pomod. She sells it for $48 a half ounce. And then that can be reduced down to 15 milliliters of essential lilac oil, uh, which is a long process for her to do with evaporation and sublimation and God knows what other chemical processes. Um, so 15 milliliters of the oil is $525, right? The oil lasts for four hours on the skin and 12 hours on a paper strip. So that's not very long. And most of you are used to your perfumes lasting a little longer than that. What you may not know is the way that the perfumers make their fragrances last longer is they add ambergris to it. So ambergris costs $63,000 a pound. Um, but you can get that down to a 3% mix of it and get 10 milliliters of that for $150. So you can order ambergris on your own as well, but it is not easy to find. And there's only a couple of people in this country and several in New Zealand that make a lot of it. The reason, by the way, for those of you who don't know what ambergris is, ambergris is a, how to put this politely, a uh, discharge from the intestinal tract of the sperm whale. 
Uh, and it floats in the ocean and washes up on some various shorelines, most commonly in New Zealand and Australia, which is where we get most of the ambergris in the world. And believe it or not, it smells great on its own. I, I love the smell of ambergris. All right, let's continue on. Uh, I want to let you know a little bit about where you can find great lilacs and learn about them more. There are some great public lilac collections in the world. All right, and this is all of them, just so you know. Uh, although I don't, uh, I don't think I put Sapporo Japan on only because I've never been there. Uh, but Sapporo has a great collection as well. Uh, the largest collection in the world of cultivars is the Lilac Museum in Saint Georges, Quebec, which is about an hour south of Quebec City and maybe an hour north of the main border. Uh, wonderful place to go visit a little town on a big river. Um, and they have a very nice festival there every year. Uh, the next uh, largest collection um, of, well, the largest collection of lilacs total in the world is at Highland Park in Rochester, New York. Every lilac lover in the world goes to Rochester as kind of their pilgrimage. It's like going to Mecca for a Muslim. Uh, I see Pat smiling there, Pat. Uh, it's very true. It's wonderful to live so near uh, the greatest collection in the world. Uh, they have about 1,200 cultivars uh, and, I'm sorry, 1,200 lilacs and 500 different cultivars there. Um, then the Royal Botanical Gardens in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, a little bit southwest of Toronto uh, on Lake Ontario, uh, is a great place to go. They, uh, the picture down here below is uh, their place. They call it the Katie Osborne Lilac Collection. It's this rolling hillside. It's absolutely magnificent. Uh, one of my favorite lilac collections in the world. Uh, Dobele Latvia is one of the few that I have not seen. They have a very large collection in Latvia. Uh, they have lots of lilacs in all the Baltic and Eastern European countries. Um, Moscow, Russia has a huge collection in two big different gardens, both at the uh, Moscow Botanical Garden at Moscow State University and the Royal Academy of Sciences, both in Moscow. I've been to both of them and they are absolutely wonderful collections. Out in Washington on the West Coast, the Holda Klager collection is big. Uh, up in Ontario, the Central Experimental Farm has a massive collection of late lilacs called the Preston Lilacs. Isabella Preston was a great hybridizer who brought us lots of uh, late lilac cultivars uh, up in the Ottawa area. You can see collections at the New York Botanical Gardens, Longenecker Botanical Gardens up in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Lilacia Park in Lombard, Illinois, which is a six and a half hour drive from us and a great collection. The Arnold Arboretum up in Boston, uh, the Holden Arboretum, and the Montreal Botanical Gardens. And that's kind of the order of the size of the collections. There are a few in Ohio, not as many as I wish for. Uh, these are the public collections in Ohio. The Holden Arboretum up in Cleveland is the largest. They have about 137 cultivars and 212 plants up there, and they're all mature. Uh, the biggest part of them are French hybrid lilacs, that is Lemoyne cultivars by uh, Victor Lemoyne and his sons uh, up in uh, Holden Arboretum. There are also a couple of other uh, decent sized collections down in Cincinnati, one at uh, Rowe Arboretum and the other at Mount, Arbor Mount Airy Arboretum, uh, just a two hour drive away from Columbus area. And then uh, Dawes Arboretum in Newark, uh, about half an hour west of uh, Columbus, I'm sorry, east of Columbus, uh, has about 50 of them. Uh, their claim to fame is probably their 15 mature tree lilacs, which are unparalleled anywhere I've ever been. I've never seen a bigger, older collection of tree lilacs. So that's where you go to start off with if you wanna go see some lilac collections. Everybody always asks me about my collection, so Here's a picture of my collection. I've got about 145 cultivars. Uh, the top picture is, uh, um, shoot, I don't even know, uh, late winter it looks like, uh, perhaps early spring. And the one below that looks like it's probably late May uh, or early June. These are probably last year. Uh, you can kind of tell that I have this massive hillside uh, with a steep uh, hill to it. Uh, so it's very difficult to plant on. I've got stones holding up my flattened areas for the lilacs. 
Uh, I keep building little fences there. And I'll tell you, the fences aren't for anything except for me to keep my balance when I walk across this hill, uh, which is really hard to do. It goes down to a nice little uh, drainage uh, area. Uh, and you can sort of see my area where I grow some of my cultivars and uh, lilac cuttings there as well. This is all from my uh, second story deck that you can see all this. So about 145 cultivars, which makes me the second largest collection in Ohio, uh, actually bigger than Holden's in terms of cultivars, but smaller in terms of total numbers. The largest collection in Ohio of lilacs uh, is a private collection uh, by the president of the International Lilac Society, Bob Zavodny, up in Akron, uh, actually in Kent, Ohio, if you know where that is in relation to Akron. And uh, he does open his garden, which is much more than lilacs, uh, to the public for two weekends every May, if you're interested in going up there sometime. It's well worth the visit. And he only charged, uh, actually he doesn't charge, he asks for a donation of like $5. There's a lot of festivals in the United States. Uh, the Rochester Lilac Festival is probably the most famous and goes on for two weeks and is well worth your time to go see. Not to mention the fact that it's got more lilacs than any place in the world and it's only a six hour drive from here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, the Lilac Sunday, one day a year at the Arnold Arboretum in Boston, which is uh, part of Harvard University. Uh, I mentioned to you Saint-Georges in Quebec, uh, which has their festival uh, for a day or two, which, by the way, includes a big uh, rock stone sculpture competition, uh, drawing people and entrants from all over the world. Uh, it's a very sophisticated little French town up in Quebec. Uh, great one to go to. Lilac Days at the Klager Gardens out in Washington. Lilac Time in Lombard, uh, just west of Chicago in Illinois. Uh, the one that got me interested in lilacs, the Mackinac Island uh, Lilac Festival up in Mackinac Island. What a wonderful place to go. They have the largest lilacs in North America. Um, probably not the oldest. We used to think they might be because they're so big, but we did some core dating of them, and they're probably just the largest because they have ideal conditions for growing up there. Uh, Spokane and Taos also have lilac festivals. So if you're in any of those towns at the right time, you can look it up online easily and enjoy their lilac festivals. Mark, could you repeat the um, name of the private lilac garden um, in Kent? Sure, that's, uh, he calls it the Wolcott Lilac Gardens. Um, Bob Zavodny is his name, uh, but look up Wolcott, W-O-L-C-O-T-T, -T, Wolcott Lilac Gardens in Kent, Ohio and open to the public for two weekends of the year in May. Great place to go to, and like I said, much more than lilacs. Uh, Bob is a dentist, uh, and this is his hobby. Uh, the home is, uh, I believe, his mother's home originally. He doesn't live there, uh, but he uh, uh, maintains the entire place. It's a magnificent collection. And he's uh, got a few Russian uh, lilacs in his collection as well. Uh, the pictures I show you there uh, uh, up the top is uh, Charlpan Dawson collecting some of her lilacs in a wheelbarrow to go enfleurage them to extract into oil. Down at the bottom, that's uh, Mackinac Island, if you've never been there, a wonderful place. And uh, the other picture there with the Orthodox Cathedral and the lilacs in the foreground uh, is in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, I took that picture myself as well. They love their lilacs in St. Petersburg. All right, I want to tell you about the most famous lilac in the world, probably, and that's Rochester. That's the name of the cultivar. It's famous because it is a multi-petaled lilac. So you remember I showed you a picture at the beginning of one. This is Rochester down here in the bottom. Look at this multi-petaled floret in one plane. It's not doubled, even though we call this radial doubling. It's what I would call multi-petaling. And a lot of these other ones here have five or six florets to them. This one here, for instance. And they also have a cupped appearance to them, which is real typical of Rochester. So Rochester was discovered in 1971 or so. Um, and because lilacs only have four petals per floret, uh, the radial doubling that it exhibited was very rare and very unusual and very desirable. In Russia, five florets on a lilac is the same as 
um, a four leaf clover in North America. Uh, it's a sign of good luck. So they'll talk about a five floret uh, lilac flower over there. And if you give one to somebody, it's a sign of good luck and they'll have good luck, just like a four leaf clover in the United States. Uh, the known record is 28 petals on a, uh, a single plane, but as you're going to see, um, there is a new record this year, and I'm going to show you some of the progeny that have come out of Rochester as well. So this year, we had one with 58 petals, and yes, we counted them. Um, it came off a double form of a cultivar called Souvenir d'Ali Sardin, which is actually a French Lemoyne hybrid named after uh, Alice Harding, who was an American. Um, this uh, particular cultivar is in Moscow, Russia, and it was a double floret, but it was found with 58 petals. So that's our new record, and we just set that this, this year. All those photos are by the great Russian um, uh, hybridizer that I mentioned earlier, Tatiana Polyakova. So the next two slides are going to show you some pictures of Rochester hybrids. If you look closely on them, a fair number of their florets are going to have more than four petals. They're going to end up with five. Uh, this one here has five, for instance. They have some unique colors among them as well. They all have wonderful names. This is my favorite white up here, Independence. Dwight Eisenhower is known for its blue. And Flower City here is famous for fathering lots of other lilacs as well. Uh, and it has that really unique looking color, don't you think? Look at that color. I love that color out of Flower City. I don't know what that is. It's kind of blue, it's kind of violet, it's kind of purple. It just really stands out. And it has lots of descendants. So here are some other Rochester hybrids. So you ought to be able to recognize some things now. Look there, I, Arch McKean, S6, Fiala. What does that mean? So the S means a single flower, which you can tell by looking at it. The six means it's a magenta color, and Fiala is the name of the hybridizer. So since this is being given mostly for Central Ohio, uh, everyone should know the name of Father John Fiala. Fiala was a Akron area priest and lilac hybridizer in the 70s and 80s primarily, and he wrote the main encyclopedia having to do with lilacs, uh, which you can still find today, particularly in its uh, later revision in 2008 uh, by Frank Vruckman. So Fiala and Vruckman is the encyclopedia of lilacs. Uh, so you see his name there on what, four of those. And Fenicia was a Rochester hybridizer who used Rochester as well. Uh, Rochester, of course, was discovered in Rochester. Uh, those are some of the names of some of their hybrids and extremely desirable. My favorite is over here, Wonder Blue, which tends to produce lots of five and six floret uh, uh, flowers as its own hybrid. All right, we're going to finish up with just a really quick little quiz. It is almost impossible to recognize a cultivar just by looking at it. Uh, you basically have to know what its paternity is and, and where it came from, that you got a cutting from it. And only with extreme study and lots of evaluation can you tell that it is what it is. But here are four that any lilac enthusiast could tell you the name of just at a glance. So just for fun, I'm putting them up here. Take a look at them and see if you know what any of these lilac cultivars are. The one in the top left, you should know by now. That's your biggest hint. The one in the middle is often called the most beautiful lilac in the world. It always wins our votes and polls for the most beautiful lilac in the world. And I honestly think it's because of that gorgeous contrast between the pink bud and the white florette. The one on the right is certainly a double blue flower, but that's not why it's so recognizable as much as look at that leaf. One of the rare variegated lilacs in the world. And then the one down on the bottom left is commonly for sale at nurseries all over the country. And for that matter, all over the world, including in Europe and Russia. Um, you notice the Pika tea like look to it with the white edging over the purple. 
There is no other light. Well, that's not true. There's no other lilac in the world exactly like this. There's a few that are similar, but they are also extremely rare. So the names of these lilacs are what I've listed there. Uh, Rochester, which we talked about. Uh, Beauty of Moscow, which the real name of it is Krasovitsa Moskvi. Uh, but in this country, we call it the, uh, the trademark name of Beauty of Moscow. On the top right is Okube Folia, which was discovered back in 1907. Uh, and by the way, you'll find that planted as a giant lilac in downtown Chagrin Falls, Ohio, up near Akron. I was shocked to discover it growing there. And then Sensation on the bottom left is one that people all over the world absolutely love. If you want to know more, these are the places to go. Uh, the International Lilac Society has a website with a lot of information on lilacs. And we have a Facebook group that's open to all people, not just members of the ILS. So anybody can join. We have about uh, 800 members on that Facebook group. It's obviously most active in the uh, uh, March through June timeframe. Um, but we will answer your lilac questions. Uh, most of the experts on lilacs are on there from time to time and are happy to help you out with questions you have about your lilacs. Mike, that's all I've got. Uh, how are we doing for questions? Oh, before we get to some questions, that is um, incredibly amazing presentation, Mark. Uh, never seen uh, such a uh, in-depth, comprehensive uh, uh, presentation about uh, one plant like that by our by Master Gardener. Uh, we really appreciate your expertise. Uh, some of the questions you've answered, uh, which always uh, is helpful, uh, you know, that people write them down, don't stop us from them. Um, but let me go through here. Uh, you know, someone asked, you know, if you put the rooted uh, ones, you know, the new ones you root, the pots, how long before you plant them in the ground? You may have even covered that. Did you say a year? Um, well, uh, yes. In general, I wouldn't want to put them in the ground until the next year. And you could actually wait another two or three years. My only rule is I'd like to have them in the ground before they hit three or four feet tall. Uh, I've, I've written a uh, detailed, actually two detailed articles on how to root lilacs because it's a very involved subject. Those articles are available free to anybody in the world by going to the website of medium.com, medium.com and just do a search for me or my articles on cuttings and you can have all the details uh, that are freely published there and you can use as you want. Mark, if, if, uh, if you also want to uh, uh, sometime send me the, the links to those, what I'll do is I can post those documents with this, uh, with your slide set on our Master Gardener site, um, especially for folks who uh, weren't able to participate tonight or for people that wanna look into it further. Sure, no problem. Um, uh, Judith from your class is saying that she has a, a five foot um, a lilac that kind of used to be out in the sun, but uh, trees have grown over it uh, over time. She wants to know when the best um, time is to transplant it and how big should the root ball be for a five foot lilac? <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> like most plants, most trees, the best time is in the fall uh, to plant it. it it could be done in the spring, but I'd want to do it in March if I were doing it in spring. Uh, the root ball, the bigger the root ball, the bigger chance it has of surviving. So the answer is as big as you can do it. Um, I would probably cut it back before transplanting it. So if it's five foot now, I would cut it back to no more than two to three feet. Uh, the following year, it'll start shooting up with no problem. Certainly within two years, it'll be much bigger. Much bigger. You don't have to worry about that. Um, um, he is asking, what variety is the Edward Gardner? Is it the common type, the hyacinth or something? <laughs> Great question. Um, I can tell you the answer to that in a minute. Uh, Edward J. Gardner, I assume you're asking about? Edward J. Gardner is a common lilac, not a hyacinthiflora. Uh, it is a double pink and it's gorgeous. I've seen it. Uh, actually, I thought I had it, but when it finally bloomed this year, it didn't turn out to be Edward J. Gardner. That happens with lilacs. Uh, but I got a new one ordered and I just did, uh, I have that in a pot right now. We'll plant that this fall. 
so it's a one of the great uh, lilacs, uh, a common lilac. It was uh, uh, grown by a guy named Gardner before 1950. So it's been around a while, and uh, anybody can reproduce it that wants to. I believe uh, Moeller uh, says that, uh, by the way, Germans smashed the bottoms too. Yeah, it seems uh, to be a European and Russian thing about smashing the bottoms. I don't know. What is the best way to treat powdery mildew on lilac? Um, by ignoring it. Um, you really can't do anything about powdery mildew. It's a fact of life with lilacs, especially common lilacs. It is ugly. Uh, I don't like it, but it doesn't harm the lilac in any way. The only thing to really do about it is to hybridize and grow mildew resistant varieties. Uh, there's not a lot published in the literature which are mildew resistant. I usually share my list of mildew resistant and mildew susceptible lilacs every year on our Facebook page, uh, the International Lilac Society's Facebook page. Uh, and I keep track of that every year with all the cultivars that I grow. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really do it for any others. Uh, it's just too far to go to visit those collections. Um, so some varieties are more resistant than others. The late lilacs, the tree lilacs, and most of the uh, little leaf lilacs do not get mildew. It's only the common lilacs that do. And I would say about half of them are susceptible and half are more resistant. Mark, does having um, powdery mildew, would that be responsible for a lilac not blooming for a few years? No, absolutely not. Okay. Powdery mildew does nothing to the lilac beyond looking ugly. Now, I suppose if you had a massive infestation that completely got rid of the visible green on the lilacs, and I did have that once, by the way, uh, it could keep that lilac from flourishing and blooming. But in general, I've never heard of it keeping lilacs from blooming. Mark, what, what's the, um, the, the number one cause or maybe the top couple of causes of lilacs not blooming? Because we do get that question quite a bit in our, um, oh, sometimes in our helpline and, and I, I've gotten it at uh, Ask Master Gardener booth, other events. Um, beyond the late um, pruning, um, what would be some other common reasons that lilacs would repeatedly not bloom? So uh, obviously late pruning is the most common reason, number one. The second most common reason is not getting six to eight hours of sun per day. Uh, lilacs are planted, they grow big, they end up under the shade of trees, and they just don't get enough sun to bloom. Um, probably the third reason was, would be planting them in areas that are too warm, uh, or more specifically where they don't get cold enough. Lilacs need one or two weeks of temperatures in the 30s Fahrenheit uh, in order to bloom each year, to set their buds, if you will. Uh, so it's got to get cold enough uh, in the uh, winter to be able to have lilacs as well. I think those are probably the three most common causes. Getting a couple questions, Mark, about scale. A couple of people say they've had scale problems or have it now on lilacs. Your thoughts about that? Yeah, scale's a problem. It's not a big lilac problem. Uh, somebody gave me a couple of smaller lilacs with scale on them, and I just uh, took them and got the scale off by hand, um, and those lilacs did fine after, after that. Uh, so I think you can do that if they're small enough. If they're bigger, it's a real problem. Uh, I'm not really sure what type of uh, insecticide you would have to use on scale. Uh, it just sort of depends how valuable the lilac is when you get to that degree of infestation. I tend to digging them up and, and burning them or bagging them and throwing them out and just plant a better lilac. Mark, have you ever used um, either a dormant oil or a summer oil on uh, lilac with scale? Have uh, 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 res good results or not? Yeah, I, I have used dormant oil. Uh, my favorite, would, by the way, would be neem oil, N-E-E-M. Um, and dormant oil or neem oil will effectively slow down or stop mildew as well if you want to try that but the problem is you have to keep spraying it every week throughout the growing season in order to keep down that powdery mildew. Uh, it's a good preventative in the spring uh, if you only have one or two lilacs it's a reasonable thing to do if you've got 145 of them growing to nine feet tall it's not very reasonable. It's expensive too. Uh, Mark, there's a question, how many years until a young lilac will begin to bloom? 
So the general rule is three to five years, and people don't really understand that. Five years is not uncommon. I've heard of them taking seven to eight years to flower. Um, the smaller ones will tend to bloom in about three years. But I, everybody asks me, I usually tell them, expect to be four to five years. That's why lilacs are really a plant that needs patience. And if you're a person who needs immediate gratification, they may not be for you. So Mark, we have one question from Bernadette that we get a lot about different uh, plants and is uh, usually hard to uh, do autopsies, but she says she had a, uh, a president and all the leaves turned brown and crispy black and dropped. What can I do? I really don't want to lose the lilac. Uh, Bernadette, I assume that happened um, in quick succession and this year, you can unmute if you want to provide more information. So Bernadette, I'll tell you what happened is your lilac got bacterial blight and you can't save it. You have to dig it up, bag it and throw it away. Uh, and then I would probably dig up most of the soil, put in some fresh garden soil, wait a year and then you could replant another lilac. Uh, there are some lilacs that will do that with just one branch. As soon as you see a branch turn brown and then black, you prune it off and get rid of it and don't put it anywhere near your lilacs so they don't get contaminated. Uh, this can be pseudomonas, it can be other types of uh, bacterial blight, um, but when you see a branch or the whole plant turn that way, um, forget about it. Um, and Bernadette's uh, kind of confirmed in the chat box that it, it started this, this summer, one season. So Yeah. Uh, every year I have one or two lilacs that have a branch or so that that happens to. I just cut it off and pitch it, and it, the rest of the lilac does fine. Doesn't look like other questions, Mark. Just dozens, literally dozens of comments uh, about how wonderful uh, this was and, and appreci appreciation to you for that. I will go ahead and post Mark's um, slides on our Master Gardener website um, as long as Zoom cooperates. Um, I, will, I can post the recording there as well. Um, that'll take a couple days sometimes before we get the address from the cloud from Zoom. Um, but if, if, if you'd like either links to either of those, um, just shoot me an email. The address is hogan.1, that's H-O-G-A-N dot one, the numeral one, hogan.1 at O-S-U dot E-D-U. And so unless anybody has a, a, another burning question, Mark, uh, again, thank you for an amazing presentation. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking My when pleasure. the world gets back to um, normal that we need to do an in-person presentation with Lilacs, um, with uh, take, take advantage of uh, uh, your experience and knowledge with, uh, with this plant. So thanks to you and thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Great to see you all. It was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Mark, there was 132 folks on. Oh, very nice. Yeah, great, great. Appreciate you doing this. Amazing. Uh, very fun. You know, as I love lilacs so much, it's wonderful to share. Mark, should I, um, you said you might have changed your um, uh, presentation just a